Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 245 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing gold farming and real money trade. So we'll be talking about people who make real world money by buying and selling goods that exist only in video games. And I'm joined by two guests. So first up, we've got Julian DeBell. He's written about technology and gaming for media outlets such as the New York Times Magazine and Wired. And he's also the author of the books My Tiny Life, Crime and Passion in a Virtual World, and Play Money, or How I Quit My Day Job and Made Millions Trading Virtual Loot. He also practices law as an associate in the technology transactions practice at the global law firm Mayor Brown LLP. So Julian, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here, Dave. And also joining us today is Marcus Eikenberry, a.k.a. Marky Dragon. For the past 20 years, he's been a major figure in the virtual goods industry and has operated businesses within many online games, including Ultima Online and World of Warcraft. He also has a popular YouTube channel with over 60,000 subscribers, where he creates content and drives sales for games such as EVE Online and Shroud of the Avatar. So, Marcus, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Okay, so let's start with Julian. So, Julian, from reading your book, it sounds like you were really one of the first journalists to cover this phenomenon of real money trade in video games. So how did you first get interested in the subject? Well, what what uh, first piqued my interest was um, a paper that was published, um, I think, in 2001 by uh, Edward Castronova, uh, who was an economist, who um, published a paper at the time um in which he calculated the the gross national product of the online role playing game EverQuest which at the time was the biggest uh of the massively multiplayer online games we uh or MMOs as we call them um that was operating in the space um i i i Marcus helped me out here i don't know i don't remember exactly what the gdp <laughs> Oh, I don't remember either, but was it, that he it, was, it was larger than some countries. I do well, remember yeah, that. It, 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 so it was in the hundreds of millions, um, and, and which in itself is not uh, uh, not a big deal for for a GDP, GDP but, but calculated per capita. That was the big number. Yeah, it was like um, – it was bigger than India's or, or China's at the time. Um, and uh, you know it was sort of it was right there between i think uh saint kitts and 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 maybe uh <laughs> maybe turkey or something at the time it was um but it was it was a remarkable number and really what was remarkable was um that he was able to do really reliable economic econometric calculations on the eco economic value of the goods produced in virtual worlds because there existed this crossover economy where people could buy virtual items. Um, we're talking about in these games, these are role-playing games where you go out and you fight monsters and you level up as you do so and you, and you, you get loot from the corpses uh, or or of the of the monsters you slay or from trading with um, non-player characters in the game um, or with other players in the game and these are you know magic swords or or suits of armor that give you extra powers uh, or magic potions and that kind of thing uh, and the other thing you can do is buy them in the game from other characters and other players um, using the local currency of the game so it's usually a gold piece or I think in uh, in EverQuest it was platinum, um, and um, and that ultimately becomes the hot commodity in these um, uh, what are called real money trading or RMT venues. I don't know if that phrase is still used, Marcus. Um, but it's still a dirty word. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, and, and and so anything. I mean, what was brilliant about uh, Castronova's work was that he was able to use this economic mechanism called shadow pricing, where uh, even if you if you have a black market, say, 
um, and you 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 can't know what all the prices are within that black market. If you can find a parallel market that's tracking the items in that in that economy, then you can uh, deduce the value uh, of what, what's going on in that shadow economy. And so he went to these markets on, at the time it was eBay was the big market for selling, um, items from virtual games and, and online currency from virtual games. Um, and he would go there and sort of figure out what was, so what was the, what was the value of the loot that people were acquiring in the course of leveling up? And then also looking at, you could trade characters, right? People sold characters once they had leveled them up to a certain level. You know, they were worth a lot of money to other players who didn't want to go through the the grinding uh, hassle of, of leveling up to level 70 or 40 or whatever was the top level at the time. Uh, and so he could look at the prices that the characters were going for and say, okay, for every level that you add, you're adding this much value. So then he looked back and he said, so, all right, so how much, um, you know, how much time does it take for uh, a person to add a level? How much time does it take for them to acquire, you know, this much gold or platinum within the game? And then extrapolated from that to say, well, you know, and then there's so many players in the game and they're on for so many hours per day and say, therefore, within a given year, we can calculate that EverQuest has a gross domestic product of, I think it was 300 million, something like that. Right. And so you say like this is considerable amounts of money are involved here. You talk to a bunch of people who say that they're making six figures incomes just by buying and selling gold and magic swords and things like that. Um, so let's get Marcus in here too. How did you get involved in this whole virtual goods industry? Uh, back in 97, uh, Ultima Online came out in September, and it was um, a wonderful game, and I was spending a lot of time in it. And uh, my wife at the time, she she kind of made this comment to me about I could have a real job. <laughs> um, now, I, 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 I've always been, pretty much all my life, been an entrepreneur and self-employed. and uh, But I was consider, you know spending a considerable amount of time in the game. And uh, so my immediate thought went from playing the game to can I have fun and actually earn money? And I heard somebody in the game mentioning something about that they they saw a sword on eBay or something like that. And uh, so I immediately went to eBay and looked. And sure enough, I found like just a couple of swords or something like that for the game. And I thought to myself, I... I have some of these swords and they're, they're selling for like 20 bucks. So, you know, was it, you know, did it take me $20 worth of effort to acquire these? And, you know, I wasn't really sure. So I started testing the market. And, uh, next thing I knew I had sales going gangbusters within, within the game. And, uh, it, it really took on a life of its own from there. And you started like, you became part of a big network as well, right? Well, so I uh, found, uh, so after I'd been doing it for a little bit, I, what I found was is that there was some horrible problems in the marketplace. There was just some major fraud going on. And uh, so I was taking losses that, um, that were just absolutely huge. And, and it was because I was taking money in from people who were using a hacked PayPal account or a stolen credit card or whatever, but I didn't know that they were not legitimate. And so I would find out, you know, a few days later or maybe even a month later, whenever a reversal would come in and it'd be like, well, you can't really have this money. They filed against it saying that it wasn't, you know, that uh, it was improperly spent or whatever. And so uh, I started looking for some resources of of other people that were also doing this. So by this time I had, uh, you know, what I looked at as competition. and. So, you know, looking at these guys, I found I found a, a couple of them that were together and they uh, seemed to be doing legitimate business and everything because there was a lot of illegitimate business going on, too. And uh, joined this group. They called themselves the UO Brokers. And I don't know, I'd only been there for a week or two when the guy who started the group announced that he had sold the group. And I'm like, what? You can't sell me. How does this work? And 
Uh, so found out that it was another competitor that I really didn't care for that, uh, that had purchased the domain and supposedly the group. And so I then turned around instantly and next day had my own software built and everything so that we could, all of us who wanted to leave there could and continue doing our business and everyone left. So it ended up, uh, that, I was then running this uh, group of, I think there was eight of us total. And uh, through through working together, we were able to figure out a lot of these issues of uh, fraud and everything. We, were, we you know kept like internal blacklists and, and, and good lists and stuff like that. I mean, could you give us some sense of this in, in Ultima Online, what kind of volume of business you were doing or like how big of a business was this for you? I uh, recall... It uh, being, uh, for quite an extended period of time, at least $30,000 a month in sales. And uh, the profit on that was typically more than double, but it needed to be to counteract for the fraud that we would take. Um, because, because fraud would be a significant portion of that. If we, if we were taking that much fraud these days, um, you know, PayPal would shut us out. And, uh, you know, any other payment processor, they'd be like, no, you are gone. Cause you know, we were five, 10%. Um, and, uh, so it was a pretty significant portion, but then, but then we discovered something else, which, um, might segue into another portion of this conversation, which is that, that there are two types of people who are, uh, who we were doing transactions with. One is, the people who have a lot of time and don't have a lot of money, and then the others who have a lot of money but don't have a lot of time. And so we would then uh, do things like sell the people with a lot of uh, money, uh, we would sell them gold in the game. And then, then the, but other people who didn't have a lot of money but had a lot of time who were producing the gold in the game, which is the currency, uh, would buy game time from us. And so I was, you know, purchasing big blocks of game time in like 30 and 90 day increments for Ultima Online and then selling that for gold in the game and then uh, turning around and selling the gold to the to other people who had cash. And we were doubling every time. And uh, that's that's when things really took off. And so so by game time, you mean the sort of subscriber fees, uh, the monthly fees to play the game? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, okay, so Julian, and it must have been around this time that you kind of got into this too. This is the subject of your book was you decided you were going to set aside a span of months and try to see if you could make a living uh, just dealing yeah. dealing in Ultima Online. Just tell us about that experience. Uh, it was very interesting. I mean, it started with an article that I wrote for Wired. You know, after I had uh, read Casanova's paper, I said, I want to write about this. And uh, I ended up profiling a guy um, – uh, who, uh, named Bob Kiblinger, um, who lived in West Virginia and, and it worked out of his home, made a living. And, you know, I think he, he was, he claimed to be made doing like six figures at the time, uh, kind of, uh, but he would like buy people's accounts in Ultima online. Um, and, and then kind of break them up and sell the pieces off. So, you know, somebody been in the game for a long time would have, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, th their characters would be worth money. Um, they would also have, uh, lots of equipment, um, that was valuable and, and, and gold pieces, um, that were valuable. Uh, they, you could also in Ultima online own, own real estate. Um, and so I, I kind of, it, for this story, I, I tracked this one castle that that uh, Bob had sold from, you know, the, its its origins uh, with the guy who had originally built it, um, and then he how he sold it to Bob when he he had to break up his character, uh, and and so that fascinated me, and I was kind of um, at a crossroads, wondering you know what my next uh, book project would be, and and you know really whether I wanted to stay 
being a, a writer anymore. It was kind of frustrating way to make a living. And I thought, well, you know what? I could do a project where I <laughs> try out this other way of making a living for a year. And, you know, worse comes to worse, um, I get a book deal out of it. And that's that's how it worked. Um, and and it was very educational because I I started from, you know, the the ground up like, OK, I have some stuff uh, on my character on Ultima Online. I was already uh, playing and I and I had managed to get some real estate. I'm going to, you know, sell some of this stuff that I have. Um, buy some gold try to turn a profit on that um and, and then you know put the put the profits back into buying more stuff from from people in the game uh and that was very educational because mainly because after a while um i realized that if you do it in that kind of very piecemeal way um it, it, it's just not going to scale um, you cannot really start making a, a decent living from buying and selling um, online assets in, in these online games until you start buying from like wholesalers uh, that are really uh, producing um, virtual assets in in quantity. And that's where you start running into the world of things that are kind of uh either on the on the edge of or 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 going right over into breaking the rules of the games. People who are using uh bots uh to to create uh gold, for instance, this is like, you know, they'll they'll have a bunch of characters and they'll write scripts to have the characters do repetitive um, activities over and over again while they're not sitting there dealing with them. Um, and that will pile up a lot of gold in, in a lot of times. And those are the people I found. And, and, you know, Marcus can <laughs> disagree with me if, if, uh, if he has a different take, but I found that that was the only way, uh, that I was really going to start building the business. And so I started dealing with these very interesting guys who were, you know, had, had, a dozen PCs running in their closet, running, you know, 10 characters on each one, uh, 24 seven, just, just, you know, I, I forget, you know, they'd be doing some task like, uh, cooking chickens or something. They always, there was always some new thing that they were moving on to, uh, that was the best way to make gold. Some of which involved, frankly, exploits, you know, figuring out ways to, uh, trick the software into thinking, you know, that they had done things that they hadn't. Uh, there was there there was a famous hack where somebody figured out that if you, uh, you know, put a piece of gold in your backpack, then did something with the software, then opened your backpack again, there'd be two pieces of gold. And if you did it again, there'd be four pieces and so on and so on and so on. Uh, so you're, you're duplicating your gold. Uh, every time you, you, you run the operation. Um, and so these hacks came to be known as dupes. Um, I think that's the, that's at least yep. the folk etymology of it. Um, so it was a fascinating education. I, uh, by the end of it, um, you, you know, I think total amount of, of profit I actually took, um, during this year was um um uh, you know in in the neighborhood of fifteen thousand dollars for a year which isn't great but but that was because it took me a while to ramp up by the end i really was uh um and you know with the help of of uh uo brokers who who let me work with them um uh, that also was a big help, you know, getting access to to markets. Um, you know, I had some help on that end. Uh, by the end of it, I was making about, I think it was about five thousand dollars a month uh, profit. And you know, I got to say that was better than almost any. <laughs> you know, if I had stuck with that and kept up that rate of profit, I, I would have done better than I did in subsequent years as a writer. Uh, but that's another story. Well, yeah, I'd be happy to be making that much doing this podcast. So, <laughs> exactly. Um, but when you talk, start talking about the bots, that kind of gets into the issue of how did the game manufacturer feel about all this stuff? I mean, Marcus, do you want to talk about how did 
um, Origin or EA, whatever it was, feel about it? Yeah. So, uh, and and Julian and I both worked in uh, Ultima Online for this, right? And um, the the uh, the fact is, those those people did exist, and they were uh, doing those things, and um, and that was always a quandary because um, they would come up with large amounts of of gold or other products. And, um, and you had to be very careful with those things because, you know, if you knowingly take something that is, you know, illicitly gotten, then what are you doing? I mean, that's a problem. And, and so, uh, we did travel a lot in these gray areas and everything. And, uh, there were, there were bots. I mean, there, there were guys that I knew that were running like a hundred accounts simultaneously and stuff. And the, uh, software developers or the publisher, uh, they, of course, as they would catch them, would shut them down. And, um, they, it, and it was kind of inevitable. I, I actually interviewed several of these people, uh, at different times, um, you know, on my show and, and, and they, they love to brag about it. And what happened was, is that they just get greedy. And so they're like, okay, well, um, you know, I need to, paint the house this summer so let's turn it up 30 <laughs> percent and and there was one guy who i talked to quite often which i really didn't deal many transactions with him because i was i was really kind of afraid of him um afraid of him in the in the fact of that i didn't want to be crossing this line it it um it, it bothered it it bothered me personally and but he did um uh he paid for a house in full off of Ultima Online Gold, off of uh, running, you know, running a whole bunch of computers, um, all doing whatever repetitive actions to make money in the game, and uh, they would they would find these loopholes or these exploits or whatnot, and then they, you know, would and they were like reverse engineering the code to find these things, and then they would keep quiet about it. They wouldn't tell anybody about it, and the only time that they would tell me about it is when it had been fixed. And uh, it, it was very fascinating, uh, but at the same time, so detrimental to the game. And I, I can tell you these days, the game publishers have this a lot more figured out. And uh, so the, the games that I'm dealing with these days, uh, we don't see this kind of stuff. And in fact, we don't see the Chinese farms really a whole lot either and stuff. So um, it, it's interesting how the, the industry has changed to defeat this. So. Well, well, yeah, well these, these stories, um, Julian, in your book, though, about these bots are so interesting because the only way it sounds like that the game makers had of detecting these bots was basically to go into the game and talk to them and see if they seemed like a real person. And <laughs> people had all sorts of crazy schemes to, <laughs> to try to make their bots seem like real people. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they, I mean, it got to where in some cases they were actually, you know, borrowing some of these chat scripts that, that uh, you know, have, have also gotten more and more sophisticated, starting with like Eliza, you know, these, if you talk to them, they can kind of, uh, you know, pass a Turing test for, you know, 15 right. minutes. I don't speak <laughs> English very well. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Here, let me try and translate. Did this come out right? Yeah. Yeah. Crap like that. L Long enough to convince a you know a game master in the game that ah eh, they probably are a really a person I'll leave them alone or or long enough in one case to like stall the game master and and send a text to the bot operator to say hey you better get online oh, and yeah. you know talk to this <laughs> mm -hmm, talk to this mm -hmm. person page um yeah <laughs> back but, when we had pagers. But as 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 Marcus alluded to, I mean, th this was this too was an early phase of this kind of exploitation of trying to figure out how to get volume um, in, on the production side. Kind of the next phase that that Marcus alluded to was, um, you know, overseas uh, gold farms, as they called them. Um, and you know these were things that were rumored for a long time. In fact, the article, the Wired article that I ended up writing about Bob Kimlinger started as me going to Tijuana to chase down this rumor that someone had set up basically a sweatshop there, um, 
you know, to have people play the game, not even necessarily using bots uh, because, you know, the labor was cheap enough, um, but sometimes aided by bots um, and and produce gold uh, under those circumstances. And, you know, I couldn't I couldn't locate the sweatshop. It was a rumor for many years. It was a rumor um, and people would deny it. And some of the biggest volume sellers, I remember going to a conference in, in 2004 um, and the, the guys from IGE, which became the biggest mm. virtual gold seller, kind of the, the Walmart, if you will, of, of virtual gold, uh, just flat out denying, oh, no, there is no such thing as gold farms. That's that's a, a rumor. I kept chasing the story and eventually got a lead and ended up going to China and writing a story for the New York Times Magazine in which, yeah, I visited these factories in China um, that are literally guys, you know, working 12-hour shifts, seven days a week, living in factory dorms right in the same building, um, playing at this time. They were playing World of Warcraft, which was the big MMO at the time. Uh, and just cranking out the gold one way or another. Um, and and really, at that point, the bot guys in the U.S. couldn't even keep up because it was almost like the, the cost of the electricity to run <laughs> their... <laughs> Their bots was was more than you know what the what the the difference in the economy in kept kept the labor very cheap. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Marcus, I just watched an interview you did with this Chinese gold farmer broker, uh, Jared Sagoda. It was uh -huh. fascinating because he just had he was talking about how uh, nimble you have to be because the uh, game makers keep quashing different things and. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a really fascinating conversation. I was so surprised how open he was with me. And uh, so, but I, I I suspect at that time, too, that he saw the writing on the wall, that um, that, that stuff was going to be coming to a close. And so he was pretty open about it. Um, and, and to his credit, he he has a big game company in China now, and they they translate games into English and bring them, you know, bring them to Western culture. So... Um, yeah, interesting guy though. Very incredibly smart guy. Yeah. So, so what actually did happen with the gold farming and the botting and stuff? What was it that actually brought that stuff sort of um, brought it to heel? I, I think it's just hyperinflation or collapse of the value of of the you know the currency that they're generating. Um, you know, and th and then you know. The like IGE became really big and then it went, you know, kaboom. And, um, and, you know, I don't know. I guess by around 2010, there was not really that much happening in that area. It was still happening, but, but it wasn't nearly as prevalent as it was back in like 2005, 2006. And in 2010, I know for, for us, so in this, in this realm of, you know, uh, when, when we first started dealing in these markets, the, uh, everybody was like, holy cow, this is so cool and stuff. And then, and then the lawyers came in and said, well, we really shouldn't be allowing these kind of things to happen in our game because if they have value to these items and then we shut down the service, we could be liable. And so like Ultima Online, you know, they grandfathered myself and the other Yo brokers in and said, you guys are good to continue because we've been doing honest, you know, honest business. But uh, then the perception changed and everything, and and it really became where your real money trade or RMT became a very uh, hated thing, and uh, so as it progressed through and everything, I, I know that we saw that the transactions that we were doing became less and less and less, and uh, and there was a lot of uh, work on the part of of like World of Warcraft and stuff where. Uh, they actually were sending lawyers after us and everything, even though I wasn't actually, you know, our company wasn't actually touching any product whatsoever. We were just verifying transactions, you know, verifying money coming in and going out that it was legitimate. Um, but uh, they, you know, sought to to bring lawyers after us and involve us in lawsuits and such. And um, and then for myself, something happened. I interviewed Joffrey Zotkins or Zatkins in. Uh, at a conference, and he was one of the original developers in EverQuest, uh, which uh, Julian was was mentioning about having you know all of these transactions and and stuff in there. And 
what um what he showed me in this interview was that how detrimental all of this kind of RMT activity was to the game and how it impacted the publishing, you know, end of it to where you could not allocate nearly as much funds towards the further development of the game that you would want to because you were spending so much on customer service. And uh, after that interview, it's like I got back home and I decided we're not touching this stuff anymore. And and we quit. So I'm, I mean, could you say why why it costs more for customer service because you've created this huge financial incentive for people to steal other people's accounts and sell them and stuff like yes, that? Yes, yes. And and you've also uh, created an incentive to have these armies of people or of bots in there that are not in there to interact. They're not in there to play the game and have fun. They are there for the sole purpose of acquiring more items of value so that they can sell them and uh, and make money. And so so they don't provide good value to the other players. Uh, and, and the customer service, you know, the... The, the account hackings were a huge problem for so many people. In fact, I got my account hacked once, and I knew that stuff was going on, and I was very careful about that kind of stuff. And, and there was no legal resource or, or, or remedies or anything for when you got hacked and stuff. When I got hacked, I took my case to the FBI because nobody else wanted to take it. And then they wouldn't take it because it didn't, you know, it wasn't like at least a $100,000 worth of loss, my piddly $2,000 account. And so it was all of that stuff, though, just created a huge resource demand uh, on on the game publishers. And um, and that for me was kind of an epiphany, a, a moment of saying that that, you know, I just don't um, I don't want to support anything, I, I, even though the stuff we were doing in UO was legit and, and everything. I, I didn't want to support that kind of activity at all anymore. Yeah. Well, so Julian, when Marcus starts talking about these lawyers here, so you're you're a lawyer now. How do you feel about the some of the legal aspects that he's talking about? Well, look. Let's be clear. I mean, it, it's it. This was an issue from the beginning. I think Ultima Online was was a rare exception um, among the MMOs uh, of a, in the sense that it was. It permitted uh, real money trading. It did not have an explicit ban on trading your assets, your in-game assets, for real money. Um, all the other games um, were uh, very clear uh, that this was against the rules, and, and were you know making these arguments. Um, all the time about you know uh that this was um you know that it was a drag on their profits um no i uh, and i so we we knew you know that this was not uh looked on kindly except in in ultima and even there there was a lot of you know player animus against the activity of real money trading. Um, I think it's a little more complicated than just that, you know, it, it, it is a drag on resources. I think it also, um, you know, people do have a sense of investment in the game and, you know, it, it, there, there, there can't just be a downside to it. I think there's an upside to it, even for the players, for the developers to the extent to the point where they have attempted through through the years to, you know, have segregated servers where people can engage in real money trading to see if that's you know a popular uh, option. Um, it hasn't been, um, but you know there have been other uh, games like Second Life where where making money in there is is the whole point, um, or at least a huge part of it. You know, they completely encourage the real money trade. I think it's a very complicated kind of cultural. Um, a phenomenon why RMT is uh is so polar. banned. Yeah, so polarizing. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I think there's 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 deeply like uh you know almost national cultural issues in in Asia the whole pay to play. Uh, or, or freemium model of games um, has always been very popular. In other words, you play for free and then you get ahead 
in the game by buying better items. Um, and that's, you know, and, and people in the West tend to look at that as cheating, right? I mean, they say that's, let's well, not, um, that's not a kosher way to get ahead. Um, and so I think that, that plays into a lot of the bands. Um, but that said, you know, it's, these are, these games and their, their governance are creatures of contract. Um, the rules um, of of getting access to the game um, are exactly what the 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 game devs say they are, um, and so you know if they ban RMT, that's then you're you're breaking the rules, and they can come after you. Um, and if you contribute to violations, um, you know as as Marcus <laughs> learned. Um, then they at least, you know, believe they can come after you and may have a case for coming after you. Uh, so it's a, been a fascinating field. There's been lots of uh, articles written in law journals about, you know, the, the nature of property in virtual items, how, um, you know, what kinds of property theories would allow a player to make a claim against um, a game dev who says no? You know, yeah, that's yours, but you can't sell it. I mean, that's that's something that that's a weird claim to make um, in the real world. Um, and and what is it about you know these virtual worlds that changes that? So there's been lots of scholarship, and and I've I've even uh, contributed some um, in in my last year of law school. I started working on a paper uh, a paper working looking at. Um, the labor of gold farmers, these these people in China who do this work, um, uh, and, and how you know how would employment law in the U.S. apply to that? And then turning it around and saying, well, what's the difference between you know these these guys are grinding and grinding away at this really tedious work and getting paid for it, and yet you know the players themselves are grinding and grinding away at tedious work and not getting paid for it. <laughs> and what's the difference? Um, you know, it, it, it's it's a really interesting point. And you know, Marcus touched on it earlier. Like it, the real money trade kind of incentivizes a lot of people to be in there doing stuff that other people you know don't appreciate. Um, because they're just doing things too intensely or, or over, um, or over exploiting certain, uh, um, money producing, uh, activities. But, you know, there's a whole class of players, um, in every MMO, uh, you know, called like, they call them like power players, um, who are there to just maximize the crap out of, you know, whatever they can get oh, out of it. People you know, who and play got, for stats. Yeah, pay play for stats, and and people don't like them either. Right? I mean, in this, uh, people find that annoying in the same way. Like, no, this is a game; you should be having fun. And they're like, no, we are having fun. We're just having our own kind of fun. It's the meta game. Yeah. Um, so it's it, it's a fascinating question, um, and you know, and there's lots of things you can say on both sides. But at the end of the day, yeah, the game companies own these things and uh you know they can make the rules to be whatever they want and that's a big you know that's across all of virtual life right you know it's like we live our lives in these spaces more and more where ultimately it's not the government it's not the community that decides what the rules are it's some um, you know it's facebook or it's google or it's blizzard um and that's that's a whole other interesting question i commonly say that the uh, game publisher is god when you're yep. in the game, whatever God wants, God gets. Well, I mean, Julian, in your book, you talk about how you got to a point where you thought, why would anyone play this game not doing RMT? Because it's so much more fun than the actual game. But then <laughs> as the book goes on, you kind of get to a point where it's not fun anymore. And somebody posts a, a really sort of poignant comment on your blog where they say like, oh, when I go back and look at the old blog posts, you know, he was actually actually used to like this game, you know, and I guess I don't know, Marcus, what's your take on that? Do you feel like RMT makes the game more fun if you're doing it or like what's the relationship there between making money off the game and having fun with it? Well, I caution people all the time with this when, you know, in the in the games that we deal with these days that allow for RMT, we have people come to us who say, 
you know, oh, hey, I'm going to just start mass producing whatever and, and get it to you. And my initial, my immediate response is, is why? You know, because, because these games are meant to be played for fun. And, and that's, that, that is their initial purpose. And people who uh, try to play the game to make it pay or to make a living out of it, uh, it's a very difficult thing. And uh, you have to treat it like a professional business or a job. And when you, you know, go to, I don't know, I mean, like you, if you're a race car driver in real life, you know, you get out there on the track and wow, this is awesome and everything. And all of us would just love to race around the track and think that that would be absolutely great. But when you have to do it day after day after day, it's then a job. And it's the same thing with video games. So that's how I feel about it. <laughs> I mean, one thing, too, with the if the real money trade is is sort of a black market, it's really interesting in this book because you see you get, you know, any with any black market, you have crime. And the activities of a lot of these things, it reminds me of uh, gang warfare or the mafia or something where, uh, you know, they're, the, they're snitching out to the GMs on their competition and then they're trying to figure out, wait, who snitched on me? And um, Julian, you talk about these guys who they had discovered this really uh, lucrative bug and then someone else, you know, was going to blackmail them to try to get them to reveal the bug. And so they decided to just uh, tell the GMs about the bug so they would fix it so it wouldn't dilute the value of the gold that they'd already gotten through this through this bug. It's just like it's just so funny how how, the, how these sort of crime underworld dynamics uh, were playing out in this game. Yeah, I mean, I, and I don't know. Um, I Everything I described, uh, at least in in Play Money, is you know from a, a an earlier, simpler time in, in video games and and RMT. Um, I think nowadays, you know, if if any of that still exists, it's it's probably more um, industrialized. Um, you There's know, a lot with, of organized with the, crime with the overseas stuff. Yeah, like actual. Yeah, Marcus, actual like organized crime to, and money laundering. To gangs. I, yeah. I, we've had to do um, we, we've had to do uh, reviews with the government before of money in, money out, uh, to make sure that uh, that there was no money laundering going on. And um, there is a lot of organized crime, uh, and and it comes typically from certain countries. And um, if you're if you're not careful, they will take total advantage of you. And um, and you lose a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, that was one thing I really wondered reading the book is, could you do money, money laundering with this? Because it seems like once the value of these resources got into the virtual world, the government wasn't sure how to deal with them or what laws should apply. And it seems like it would be really easy for it, value to just move around. It's so easy. You steal a credit card, you buy from somebody who's selling something. And you get you get the item in the game, and then you turn around and say, "Oh, I'm quitting the game. Who wants to buy this?" And you sell it for eighty percent of its value, and you've then just laundered the money. Yeah, I mean, Julian, do you want to talk about that? Because this is sort of like you end the book kind of with this tax <laughs> issue, which is so kind of mind bending and weird. Is that you know when you're doing this as your job, you're reporting all the value of all the um, magic swords and everything as as income and you say, well, wait, but the people who are just playing this game for fun aren't doing that. So yeah. what's the difference? Like, yeah, well, actually, I mean, what I reported was the cash that I took home and that's, that's ambig That's not a ambiguous. That's, you know, any tax uh, expert will tell you, yeah, if you, if you're putting money in the bank uh, from an activity, that's income that you have to report. Where it gets weird is um, that the IRS has rules about about barter income and and prize winnings. So you know if you are a plumber and you go and uh, fix uh, go to a, a painter, an artist who you know whose whose toilet has broken and you fix their toilet um, and they give you um, a painting worth uh, 750 bucks, um, for your, your plumbing work, you both 
the artist and the plumber are required to report income of $750 um, out of that transaction, right? Or if you go, uh, you know, if you go on a game show or back in the day, Oprah used to give away cars, you go on Oprah and she gives you a car, you're supposed to report the value of that car as income. So how is that any different from, you know, I go into World of Warcraft and, and you know, slay a big end boss and get a sword uh, off of that, off of that monster that's worth, you know, I know I could sell it for $1,000. Um, and, you know, there are markets out there that will prove that it's worth $1,000. Do I have to declare that even if I never sell it for $1,000? Or, you know, if I trade it to someone in the game for a thousand dollars worth of of gold pieces do we both then you know or do we both have to declare the value of that as a thousand dollars in income so uh i was kind of fascinated by that you know all this stuff all this stuff that that all this wealth creation that castronova the economist documented in his work um is not being taxed at all, right? Until people trade it for real money. Um, and I thought, well, surely they've got this figured out at the IRS. So I ended up like going from one, you know, one uh, supposed expert at the IRS to another trying to get an answer to this. And nobody could say, you know, what the real rule on this was. And they're nervous about it too, because they've done things in the past like, declared that you had to, um, you know, declare all the frequent flyer miles that you got as income, you know, from your job. Um, and suddenly, you know, uh, business people all over the world were up in arms and, you know, and the, the IRS was embarrassed and had to retract the rule. So, you know, they, they tread lightly around these things. Um, and as far as it ever got was like the, I think the IRS ombudsman, you know, in one of their reports said the IRS should really clear this up. And that's as far as it got. So um, it does create, um, you know, interesting questions. I, you know, obviously there's no, I mean, it's a funny argument. Nobody's going in there and like dodging taxes by like, you know, making their, uh, living a a, luck, a lush life in World of Warcraft um, and then, you know, living in a hovel in real life, you know, at some point they have to like actually turn that lush life, virtual life into, into real money for, for the government to really care about it. But it's a question, you know, at what point does virtual wealth really start to sap, um, you know, the, the real economy if it's not contributing to that real economy? Right. Well, I mean, one of the blurbs for this book says something like, once you read it, you'll start looking at your, at your real money and wondering if it's worth anything. Um, <laughs> and I thought one thing that was interesting, too, that I'd never heard of was that actually there would be weird things in the game, like error message. There would be error messages that there would be a bug where you could pick it up and take it with you and put it in your house and stuff like that. And that those actually became really, really valuable, even though they didn't make your player more powerful or anything like that, just because they were rare. Um, and it makes you wonder you know, what does what does make anything what does give anything any value, right? Um, I don't, know, Marcus. Did you did you, uh, did you have experience with that, where just these like weird error messages and things would become valuable? Or yeah, they were um, the term for them is rares, R A R E S, <laughs> um, and they uh, were most prevalent in Ultima Online. Uh, so there was there's things like, you know, you pick up this dungeon door, you know, instead of opening it, when you double clicked it, it put it in your backpack or something into your inventory. And everybody's like, whoa, how'd that happen? You know, and so it was the first person to go in there that would get that. And so there'd be one on each server or something like that. Uh, or there was other ones that would reappear whenever the server reset daily. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we dealt with many of those items. And everything. Uh, but then, as was mentioned earlier, when people figure out how to duplicate items, how to dupe items, uh, those were some of the first things to be duped <laughs> because they had so much value. And, and no, they didn't make you 
any more powerful or whatnot. And like that door, you would just like set it up against a wall or something. Or, you know, if you found, um, actually one of the funnest things was, was horse dung. They never, in, they never envisioned anybody would have any need to do anything with horse dung in the game. And it was just something that was in the stables at, you know, in different towns. <laughs> but there was a couple of places where you could pick it up. And, uh, so we were picking up horse dung and putting it in our backpacks and trotting back home and going, Hey, honey, look what I found, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, and it had like a $20 value. And so we would just, you know, then, you know, we would build our own stables or whatnot at our houses and we had some authentic horse dung to put in it. You know, it's just all pixels and everything, but, um, that was, I remember one of the, one of the rare items and rocks. There was some rocks that you could pick up and stuff. And, and no, they didn't make us any better players or whatnot, but part of owning items in these games is being able to show them off. And so in Ultima Online, uh, you had property, you had a house, and you had, you know, really a, a vehicle for showing off who you were in game. And, uh, so people wanted these things. So. And it's a, you know, of course, it's a classic uh, economic conundrum. You know, why, why, you know, water is essential to life. There's nothing more important. You know, there's almost no more important commodity uh, in the world to, to existence. Diamonds are completely useless for most purposes. Oh, right. mm -hmm. Water costs nothing. Um, and diamonds, you know. Diamonds are somehow uh, the most valuable thing. Um, it it's just it's just things get weird when people start putting value uh, on the objects around them, and they have a lot to do with you know with just what Marcus was talking about. You know, s social display, um, rarity, um, um, you know, sense of of aesthetics, um, all that kind of stuff. But Ultima Online was was cute in that they they. The the way the game was set up, um, allowed that to happen for exactly those reasons. You know, in other games, you don't have like your own living room where you can show off your your rare items, um, and and I think you know probably the game devs, uh, you know, if they'd wanted to, could have like just removed those mm -hmm. rare items from the game, but they thought, hey, you know, people are people are having fun with this. Ultimate was a rare game in a lot of ways. It was. Uh, uh, the big mastermind behind it was a guy named Raf Koster, who really was interested in seeing how the online games could like parallel real world social situations. Um, and so he was very interested in allowing player versus player killing, for instance, which, you know, really a lot of people find annoying, but he thought it was interesting to see how would people, you know, band together against players. Um, and that's, that's kind of gone out of a lot of these, these online worlds. I mean, you only, only in EVE Online, I think, do you still see this commitment to allowing a really lush, open, uh, social, yeah, uh, no laws in Eve ecosystem, <laughs> yeah, emerge, the evolve, there exactly is tears. because <laughs> <laughs> making making people cry. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, actually, speaking of that, Marcus, I really wanted to ask you because I, you know, I mentioned I've watched a lot of your videos, and I don't know that I have watched enough to understand really what all the sort of ups and downs of your career in this field have been, but I, I get the sense that there have been a lot of big ups and downs. And I was just curious, are there any kind of notable ups and downs that you want to talk about? Well, I, I mean, I can say that I made my first million in, in uh, video games and I also lost it in video games. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, I've been incredibly wealthy at one point from video games, from doing this stuff. And, and I've been bankrupt twice. Um, but that's part of being an entrepreneur because I'm always pushing the limits and just trying to take things out as far as I can and, you know, finding these new undiscovered uh, territories or markets. And so, I, I don't know. What was the question again? <laughs> the, the, the opposite. Well, well, so like with those bankruptcies, is there anything like intrinsic to the game logic that led you to have big, um, you know, sort of setbacks like that okay so we are at the whim of 
the game publishers. Just like I said, the game publisher was God. I mean, it's really true. And if you have uh, what is, you know, perceived to be a million dollars worth of inventory in a game, uh, then at, uh, at anyone's whim within the game publisher or whatnot, someone can make a decision which is based upon not, not on my business, not on my ethics or morals or anything like that, but off of whatever they think and whatever they perceive right at that exact point, and they make a decision. Either they leave all the stuff alone, or they do something about it. And that actually happened to me. Because uh, at one point in Ultima Online, when we, when we finally gave up Ultima Online, I, I believe this was also in 2010, and a new GM, Game Master, which is basically a customer service person who has an avatar in the game, you know, so they can play in the game and they can get in there and they can, they can you know, perform customer service duties within the game, uh, was snooping through my inventory uh, in, in my accounts and uh, decided that what he found in there was worth banning. And so uh, he, he, he banned all of my accounts. And I think I had 13 or 14 accounts. And we had so many accounts because they were all full of, of inventory. And in Ultima Online, uh, being one of the first of these type of games, the games are much different these days. But uh, if something was deleted in the game, then you would have to do a server rollback to, to restore from an earlier point in order to restore that item. And uh, so what this GM did was he deleted all of my accounts, which meant that all of the inventory that we had across all of the servers and everything, that um, by the time I got into contact with people at EA about what was going on, you know, it had already been like 12 or 18 hours. And there was no way that they were going to roll back all of the servers for that amount of time. And so... Uh, I don't know if whatever happened to that guy, but what he found was, on my account, was that we had some items that were duped. And uh, they had apparently come into our possession seven years prior. And uh, so, you know, seven years prior, I mean, I'm like, I don't even know what to say, you know? Obviously, we weren't doing anything with those items if we'd had them for seven years. And uh, so, but... Anyway, he just decided to delete all of my accounts, and we were done at that point. And uh, so this, you know, this game, which at one point, you know, was uh, generating about thirty thousand dollars a month in sales, just instantly went to zero. So. Well, and so yeah, so I, t I told you I did want to know more about your current business, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so I, I assume you've taken your your current business is structured somehow to avoid those sorts of uh, things happening. Well, uh, yes. Okay, so any games that we deal with these days, we are officially a business partner with the game company. And uh, so that would hopefully keep things like this from happening. Uh, even though I had in writing from EA that we were grandfathered in and we were okay to do all of these kind of transactions and everything, but due to the technology and, and you know, in game companies, uh, if you talk with people who are game producers and stuff, you know that they get changed out as often as underwear. And <laughs> so you can see five or six uh, game producers, you know, go through a game, an older game in a year. And um, I guess the underwear analogy is not too good. Who wants to wear their underwear that long? <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But I'm I'm just saying that that you don't know when, uh, you know who's going to be there when you when you call them tomorrow, and so in this in this whole realm of things, uh, we have gone official with everybody that we deal with, and and we keep really good relations with them, and you know the the first one that that happened to us with was uh, for Eve Online, which was mentioned CCP. And uh, they actually came to us after seeing what we were doing in Ultima Online with uh, converting the money for game time uh, in the game. And then they ended up developing a system called Plex, where uh, they allowed people in the real world to use cash to buy these Plex codes, which then could be traded in-game for the in-game currency, and the person it was traded to would then use it to pay the subscription for their monthly on their account. 
And uh, that's exactly what we were doing. And uh, so they they came to us and, and asked us to be uh, an official reseller. And I've, I've been with a reseller with them now for like 13 years. Um, so, and, and then I, I don't know if you want to get into what's happened with like Shroud of the Avatar and Crowfall. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, so over these years, I mean, you know, uh, EVE Online has been the oldest one. And, and we, we did other games like World of Tanks and we did some other, other games in between. And then after 2010, when, when we said that, you know, we weren't going to deal in these, in these other markets, that any market that violated the terms of service or the end user license agreement of any game, uh, we all of a sudden had publishers come to us and say, Hey, now we want to do business with you. Um, but it was always real touch and go. It was just, it was just like regular retail sales. Hey, here, sell my game. Uh, but then, a couple of years ago, Gordon Walton from Artcraft Entertainment, and they're they're making uh, Crowfall. He contacted me, and Gordon, by the way, banned me once in Ultima Online. I will never forget. <laughs> <laughs> and then I met him in person a couple of months later. Um, but um, he's a, he's a great guy, and he, and he contacted me because they had this crazy idea that they wanted to bring RMT back into the game, and. So he, he, you know, he writes me this couple page email about, hey, you know, this is kind of what we're thinking of and everything. And we would like you to be what we were going to call a trusted trader. And I wrote him back a several page email telling him how many ways he was nuts. Uh, because, because there's so many fraud problems and there's so much other detrimental stuff to the games and everything. Well, he then, he then replied to me saying, when do I want to start? <laughs> And so, you know, maybe I'm a good fit for it because I because I don't want to put up with any of this BS that's going to hurt the games. And they have it figured out. And it's really kind of interesting because they have figured out how to, you know, allow for these people who want to do transactions external of the game for their in-game items for real world money and then back into in-game items again without hurting the economy internally in the game or um, or causing them big customer service problems. In fact, we are the customer service buffer uh, because we are doing these transactions and they don't have to then deal with it because they only deal with us. And, and we're a trusted commodity. And so if there are any problems, then we are able to get it resolved with them and everyone is happy. Um, and they have us paying them a percentage of each sale back to the, to the game publisher to further develop the game, which I think is perfect, and um, and I and I wouldn't I wouldn't actually have it any other way, um, because I believe that games in the very first place are something that um, that are there for us to play, for us to enjoy, for us to escape from reality, and uh, when you bring in all this reality, like real world cash and everything, it can totally destroy the game if if people aren't careful. Uh, so we started doing that for, uh, for Crowfall. And then I emailed, I I had actually talked to to Richard Garriott probably in 2011 when he was just starting to come up with Shroud of the Avatar. And, and, uh, and I told him, I said, I'm not really sure, you know, what the game's going to look like when you've got it out there and everything. I just know I want to be involved and we want to at very minimum just sell the game. And uh, so after this whole thing, this crazy thing of this trusted trader idea from Gordon, I'm like, okay, we can apply it to Shroud of the Avatar 2. And I contacted Richard and I'm like, hey, do you want to do this? And next thing I know, we're doing it. So, uh, and they had already had the same. So Shroud of the Avatar is a spiritual successor of Ultima Online. And and in Ultima Online, you know, like Julian was saying, it's a very... um, free spirited way of of policing players and everything like you know oh hey they found this rock or this horse dung or whatever and there's actually no harm in them keeping it so why do we care why do, don't spend any resources on trying to police it or anything and uh and so they've taken the same kind of philosophy with Shroud of the Avatar they're like we do not want to try and police what um players do with their in-game items externally of the game and um it's actually working and i'm very surprised but but the the game publishers have grown up 
since the Ultima Online days and the EverQuest days where it was so harmful and everything. And, and they figured out, you know, protocols and, and tracking and, and, and different methods of, um, of keeping these negative portions of these things at bay. Um, and, and I'm really happy to be playing a part in that of, uh, you know, being this uh, buffer where our business actually earns something playing in these games at the same time we're, you know, taking care of a, a very needed aspect for the community and reducing customer service uh, for the game publishers. Well, right. That was something I was wondering. That This seems like a problem that could largely be solved with data analytics, right? Because rather than yes. just deleting the account of the person who possesses the duped item, couldn't you somehow just be tracking the, the whole history of that item and figure out who duped it in the first place and punish that person or whatever? Back in the Ultima Online days, they did not have unique item numbers. So what happened was is that when you duped an item, it was just another one of those items and it had the same item number. And, um, and nowadays the, the way the, the tracking works, uh, is that something is assigned a new number and there may be some other data, uh, associated with that. And, and so I think it's a much different animal these days. And, and, you know, Julian, uh, I mean, I can give you an example of this. Julian was talking about how there was these players who play for stats and everything. And, and so one of the, one of the guys that I'd been working with for a fan site, and he was just this mega fan of Shroud of the Avatar, and he, uh, owns this, he owns a town in the game. I mean, he's, he's got a significant investment. He's somewhere between five and ten thousand dollars into the game. And he decided that he was going to take all of his empty lots in his town and plant cotton on them. And then, so he plants all this cotton which is this giant cotton field, and then he decides that he's going to spend an afternoon picking all of the cotton once it's grown. <laughs> and so he's just going through picking all this cotton, and next thing he knows, he's banned from the game. And he's like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's all freaked out and stuff. And what had happened was he statistically went so far above the norm <laughs> on how much cotton anyone has picked that the that the game itself said, oh, hold on, we are suspending your account and all of your access until someone can review this. And uh, and so that's what happened. Uh, the next day he had full access back to his account and everything, and it had been reviewed, and it, it was deemed that he wasn't abusing the system or anything. He just has a lot of cotton. <laughs> so, um, but he, he was allowed to finish picking his cotton. Right, right, yes. Good. It was his cotton picking problem. Um, <laughs> And, and so, uh, there are these things in there and, and I've sat in, I've sat in with, um, Chris Spears, their, uh, CTO and, and looked at data in the game of what people are doing. And, and it's real easy the, the way that they have stuff set up to see outliers. They can be like, show me only people who are 10% above and greater of the average or, or say, you know, who's making the most gold today? And, you know, um, and show me only people that are a thousand percent above normal. And, uh, and then they can investigate those. So much different animal these days. Yeah. Okay. So Julian, I also wanted to ask you, I saw that there's this play money documentary that looks like it's been in the works for a while. Do you know anything about what the status of that is? Very, very little. I think Marcus knows more than I do. I mean, I know I was contacted by the producers of it uh, years ago to say, hey, did they mind? Did I mind if they used the same name? Um, and I was like, fine. Uh, uh, other than that, I, do, I don't I, I, I haven't uh, kept up with them. Maybe Marcus can fill us in. Yeah, well, I can I can happily tell you that uh, we're finishing filming this year. So the filming has gone on for 10 years now. And, um, and so they've, uh, on several occasions followed me around with film crew and, and such and other people. Uh, so some of the people like Jared Sagoda, uh, who was that big Chinese farmer and, um, and then also, um, uh, gosh, why am I, IGE, um, uh, Brock, Brock Pierce. Brock, did they talk to Brock Pierce? Brock, yeah. Brock Pierce. They they uh, have uh, done a lot of stuff with him, and um, and several other people. World of Warcraft bot guy and and everything, and uh, so they are uh, finishing up filming uh, this year, and um, the final filming is actually going to be done in Austin at uh, Shroud of the Avatar, 
with uh, Richard Garriott and everything. And uh, because because now at, at the beginning of it, it was like exploring this thing, like you know, what is this virtual currency? Why does it ha- why does this stuff have any value? And and really kind of the the wonderment of that. But then but then what happened was is the whole film got put on hold because they had no punchline. Because the game companies had figured out how to quell um, this problem and and to really, you know, stop it for the most part. And uh, so the, the story kind of petered out. And then when I realized that we were actually getting back into this business again, I contacted them and I'm like, hey, here's the, in- here's the ending of the, of the documentary. <laughs> And they were like, oh, holy cow, we are so excited because we did so much work on this and we didn't know what we were going to do. And uh, so now uh, I've been talking with them a lot and, and we're finishing filming and it's going to go uh, probably this winter, uh, start making the film festival rounds. Oh, that's great. I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. I mentioned I watched the trailer a couple of times. And one thing that kind of caught my eye in the trailer is one of the sort of text messages that comes up is it says lives destroyed. Mm. And I was just curious, is there more to say? Like, could you give us a sense of whose lives was destroyed yeah. by this? Yeah, I, I can tell you that um, uh, Mike, uh, Mike Donnelly in, in the film, he is the one who created the World of Warcraft bot. And, uh, and when I got deposed by Blizzard and stuff, it was over that bot and, and everything. I didn't create it or anything. I just, in fact, in fact, we never touched any of the money from it. All we did was, you know, I put up a web page about it and linked over to them. And, um, apparently I just wrote a really great article because, um, it caught everyone's attention. <laughs> and, uh, so, but they had, they they were hiring like private investigators and stuff to get dirt on him, and and there was people following him around and and showing up at his door, uh, and um, you know he described them as you know men in trench coats you know showing showing up and and speaking in a threatening manner to him, uh, and uh, he eventually you know he went through a lawsuit that lasted a couple of years went all the way to. Um, what is just below the Supreme Court? What's the what's the court right before? Oh, so yeah, it was uh, one of the appellate appellate courts, courts, and it it's a it's yeah, and it's a pretty important decision in uh, in in copyright mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. law. I actually uh, read the case when I was in law school um, because it you know it deals with uh, what what you can ban um, as or or what what kinds of uh, when does violation of the terms of use of a game become copyright infringement, which gives uh, the game developers a whole other level of enforcement. Um, but, you know, that's a that's a nerdy legal take on it. I'm sure it was it was a really rough ride for Mike. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he uh, in the end got a judgment of six million dollars against him. And uh, so uh, now I don't know what what happened after that. Um, he's a very smart guy. And um, and he's gone on to other success, and I don't understand exactly what it is, but it, it's not in video games. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but yeah, that I mean, Blizzard was not joking around at all. In fact, they were very aggressive. And uh, so, you know, and then the, there's a, just, just other things that you can, and I don't know if the film will touch on this, but, you know, we've heard about murders happening over a video game and, and junk like that. Um, but it's it's really I think that that happens with people who have some other mental challenge there other than just being upset with their friend. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, right. I mean, Julian, you talked about one case like that in your book, right, where somebody um, loaned a magic sword to his friend and the friend sold it. Right. Yeah, uh, that well, that's you know, that comes up a lot in, in a lot of the uh writings about virtual property because you know this is why we have property laws is you know because people feel very strongly about property and they will you know commit violence uh in in the interest of it if we don't have legal regimes in place to help people sort this stuff out so yeah there was a guy in china who you know played uh played one of the multiplayer online games 
um, had a very valuable sword, lent it to his friend who then, yes, sold it for a lot of money. Um, and the real issue was he went to the local police, um, you know, and as Marcus experienced, uh, often uh, local law enforcement just uh, historically has not taken virtual theft of virtual property very they, seriously. They just have so no just clue. Kind of left, yeah, left out of the police mm -hmm. station and, and just in a fit of frustration took a, a real knife and uh, cut his friend up. Um, and and that's when the law enforcement <laughs> decided to get involved. I, I can also say that, you know, uh, I've been negatively impacted through the video game stuff before. I got swatted uh, doing one of my live shows and had a whole SWAT team here at the house and, you know, dragged me out and, you know, throw me on the ground and, and cuff me and, and uh, you know, drag everybody out of the house. So, um, I don't know, negative things can happen. Yeah. Did you ever get any idea of what the motivation for that person was or who it had been? Or it it like was that? just somebody, at least in that case, it, it wasn't like comp a competitor or anything. It, it was, uh, um, I believe, somebody who was just watching the live show. Uh, and it could have been anybody, actually. I mean, I was just the, the number one broadcaster on YouTube Live on that day and had been for seven or eight hours. And, and um, that's probably how I was picked. I don't know. Wow. I just kind of want to ask you, Marcus, you know, I, I mentioned I watched your Shred of the Avatar videos and every once in a while, somebody will buy something and a message will come up saying you rock. Oh, yeah. And then you say everybody here gets 50 gold or something. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Could you explain exactly <laughs> exactly what's going on there? We have done something that. Uh, okay, so if you ever watch live streams. Uh, live shows. Uh, it's pretty common on on Twitch and everything that if somebody somebody donates some money or whatnot to the streamer, that they get to put up a message and it'll appear up on the screen and it's kind of a you know they get this shout out in exchange for the the person creating the content to get a little more cash in their pocket. And uh, so we've taken it to another level. We actually uh, in our store, because we sell, you know, uh, these games that I play online, most of them are sold in our store. And so we just hooked up our store. We, we built a bot. Uh, it's called Barker Bot. And uh, we hooked it up to our store so that every time someone makes a purchase that's watching the show, uh, that they get a chance to put in a message. Yeah, because, you know, it, it provides an affiliate commission back to either me or you know, if I were, you know, uh, if I weren't one of the owners of the store, um, if I was just Joe Blow who was referring sales, then, um, you know, it, it each one equals money back in the pocket of the person creating the content. And uh, it's, it's a great way to uh, interact with the viewers and, uh, you know, provide some validation for actions that are positive toward the person who's creating the content. And the the customer who's buying something that might be a game they've never seen before and getting into it for the first time, or they're just it's just a regular part of their stuff where they're they're buying their subscription time or or whatever. Yeah, no, it's it's just really cool, and I, I think it's just so amazing that you're able to have a successful career, you know, playing these games and providing these services and things. I'm sure a lot of people are uh, would really like to be doing that. Who are listening to this? Uh, living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah it's so a friend of mine uh i've been i've been uh, my latest business venture is is working with actually teaching youtubers and streamers how to how to do this kind of stuff but uh my business partner on that he says to me he doesn't like to go any place with me you know when we go out to meet other entrepreneurs or you know conferences or whatnot and the reason is is because he doesn't want to be in the same room with me because when, you know, you, you've been to a business meeting before where everybody says, hey, I'm so-and-so and I do such and such. And when it gets around to me and I'm like, hello, I'm Marcus Eikenberry. I play <laughs> video games for a living. The room stops. <laughs> so all of a sudden people want to ask questions and, and you know, come and talk to me and everything. And so it's a really great magnet for business. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, but I, I, I love what I do. I could make a hell of a lot more money doing something else. You know, I could be, you know, working for one of these game publishers, you know, maybe doing what I love, but, but working for someone else. 
And um, but I'm just not built to do that. And, and, I, and I, I am independent by nature. And, and uh, so I really enjoy doing this stuff. Yeah. So if people want to find out more about your different projects in your class and stuff, uh, what where, where should they go for that? <sighs> um, you know, I don't have a good. Uh, yeah. So um, how about YouTube success dot com? For the, uh, for the, uh, you know, how to get paid to play video games. And, uh, then, uh, you can Google Marky Dragon for, uh, you know, the different things that we're into. So the, the, the YouTube success stuff is not, uh, it has my name on part of it and stuff, but that's not how we're billing it. We're billing it as labeled what it is. So, yeah, YouTube success.com. And or uh, Google Marquee Dragon. All right, cool. And so then probably the last thing I guess is um, Julian. I don't know if you got a, you mentioned that Edward Castronova got you into this all at the beginning, and I don't know if you got a chance to look at the uh, article I, I sent you guys earlier. But he basically is saying that because these online games make such a huge percentage of their money off of a small number of very very hardcore players, it would actually be it actually makes sense for them economically to pay people to play the games to provide a richer experience for the small number of people who are really contributing <laughs> uh, most of the money. And I was just curious, do you, do you have any, uh, any reactions <laughs> to that or? You, you know, I mean, that's, that's economic thinking and, and uh, you know, it, it makes rational sense. Um, but, you know, our real money trading makes rational sense too. The problem is you, you bump up against the gamer culture in a lot of these places. Um, you know, I'm sure, you know, I suspect the people, the whales, as they sometimes call them, the people that are spending the huge amounts of money in these games, uh, you know, part of the fun is that they're assuming, you know, they're up against regular players and having, you know, people pet paid players go up against them might might take some of the fun away. I don't know. My my point is um what makes sense economically from a purely classical economic rational perspective um often just plays out very differently in the space of games because games are weird and that's what makes them awesome. Well it's an interesting thought though because he's he's pitching this as sort of a solution to automation uh making people unemployed. And that maybe one value that people can provide to the economy is to provide human opponents for other people that, you know, a, a bot could do a better job, but people don't want to play against a bot. They want to play against real people. And that's, you know, not something a bot can replicate. I don't know how this would be economically viable for someone who needs to make a living and is being replaced by a robot uh, in the real world and um, to play a game and, and make enough income to um to to do anything uh it, it's an interesting thought i mean we see some of it we right now there are people who you know play to earn money but typically they are uh not in the united states typically they're in other countries where the us dollar is very very strong and um and you know where they may only be making you know, if working a full time job at whatever their location is, you know, three or four dollars in a day. And so if they're able to make 10 bucks, you know, playing in a game all day, which is, you know, all day, meaning like, you know, 10 or 12 hours at least, uh, then, you know, it's it's a great income. But as the as the world, you know, like uh, becomes shrinks smaller with the Internet. You know, we're all one people, and especially things like Bitcoin. Uh, you know, Bitcoin could just really change everything for this to where we're all on a single currency. And uh, so, gosh, I just. There are people doing this right now, but I don't see it on a big scale, and I do not see it as a replacement for U.S. workers. But let me, yeah, let me follow up, though, and say. Um... Ted Castronova is a very creative thinker and, you know, and, and we need a lot of creative thought right now to be thrown at this question of 
what are we going to do when automation takes away all the meaningful jobs? Um, and, and, you know, one of the things, one of the early observations that Castronova made um, was that there were, you know, there were all these virtual worlds in the, in the nineties um, where the whole point was just to hang out and, you know, just, you could, you could build the world, you know, all these kind of open sandboxy games, kind of like second life, but um, they weren't the ones that took off. You know, they weren't these games that, you know, posed this, what econo economists think of as a utopian world, a world where nothing is scarce, where if you want a chair, you know, to sit on for your character to sit on, you just, you know, snap your fingers and there's the chair. The games, the worlds that that really took off and, and attracted people, the one were the ones where stuff was hard. Where if you wanted a chair, you had to go out there and like chop the wood, and uh, you know, or or slay the wolves, you know, and sell their pelts for enough money to buy a chair. The idea that scarcity is fun and gives people a sense of meaning um, is important because it's it's not it doesn't go into the normal economic calculations where. Uh, the idea of worth in, in classical calculations of economics is that if it's hard, we want to avoid it. Um, and anything that removes difficulty um, uh, is valuable. Um, the, in fact, with respect to when you look at games, the opposite is true. And, and Castronova calls this the puzzle of puzzles. Why is it that something that's harder to do in some contexts, in the context of play, is actually more valuable than something that's easy to do. And I, you know, I think he's onto something. It's not just that uh, we need to figure out a way to get people paid once the robots have taken over, um, because the basic income can do that. Um, you know, the universal basic income that's talked a lot about in these, in these uh, discussions, but you know, then what, what, do we give, what do people do to give meaning to their lives? Um, and there's a lot of versions of that. And one of them is, you know, we find games for them to play. And that can, that has a very dark side. You know, I don't know if you've watched the show Black Mirror, oh, but there's one <laughs> episode, you know, where the future is everybody, you know, riding stationary bikes, um, you know, through virtual landscapes, you know, grabbing kind of Mario coins out of the air. And that's their job. Um and so, you know, it, it's a somewhat crazy idea, as as a lot of Ted Castronova's <laughs> ideas are, but it's not totally crazy, you know. And 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 it, it's a it's a great way to think about this problem of, okay, what are we going to do, uh, you know, when when the automation has finally had its way. There, there is actually an example of this in Eve Online. And uh, they call it Project Discovery. And the first one was uh, like the human genome stuff. I don't know what it all it is, but, but basically you're playing this game where, where you're actually taking scientific data and you are using the human interpretation of what you're seeing, whereas a, a computer's interpretation is different. You're using the human interpretation and then they take all this data and then they... Um, mass you know what are the what are the most common results and send it off to the scientists and uh and, and that's been very interesting they've produced uh in the last year over a million results on on this scientific study and they just now did another they're doing another one and uh they're about to start talking about it in april of um exoplanets and which is perfect for eve because it's a space game and uh, so they're taking this data from the exoplanets and they've turned it into a game to, to help identify what's really an exoplanet in real life and what's not. And uh, so who knows? Maybe this could be something like, you know, what is being talked about here of, you know, a requirement, you know, it requires humans to do these things. Uh, and, but, it's, but it's very gamified and may give people purpose.
Wow, this is just such interesting stuff. But unfortunately, we are completely out of time. So I think we're going to need to wrap things up. But um, do we, either of you guys just have any final thoughts or anything else you wanted to mention that we didn't get to? I will mention that Julian's book is still on Amazon. And <laughs> all the you, time, Marcus. all the time, we talk about your book every once in a while on the shows. And all the time I have people coming to me saying, oh, hey, I listened to the audiobook or I, or I read the book and, and they enjoyed it. So, yes, play money on Amazon. Or wherever it. Thanks so much, yeah, Marcus. Or wherever people should get it at. So Yeah. Um, it's, it's great that that lives on, you know, I've, I've moved on to, to uh, another career uh, as a lawyer. Um, but it is interesting that, you know, these questions keep coming up. I'm a technology lawyer. I do a lot of deals where companies are, you know, entrusting their data to other companies and it's, you know, kind of the same problem all over again. Okay. I'm putting my life on somebody else's platform what are the rules they're going to make to govern my life and how do we negotiate that? Um, so uh, it's, it's endlessly fascinating stuff. Yeah. And so I will definitely second the recommendation for play money. It's uh, you know, lots of stuff about video games, obviously, but then lots of stuff about economics and just philosophy. It's a really interesting book. Everyone go check it out. And yeah, so I think, I think we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Julian DeBell and Marcus Eikenberry. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. And that was our panel. So, big thanks again to Julian DeBell and to Marcus Eikenberry for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to Rebecca Smith, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So, if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarrkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.